people were brought in, these children, and they were in two very different camps. Camp number one, they came from the royal families. The children from the royal families, who were considered blue bloods, basically spent their life in the palace and in the temple, the, the heathen temples that were there, whereas all of the others who were not educated, who didn't have much training or skills, they were kind of country mouths. These young men, Esther being the same way, were part of these this families that we are told that they were from the royal families of Jerusalem. That's why all of this story is not about them in the fields working or not about them uh, laboring, but rather they spent their life amongst the royalty. That's why someone like Nebuchadnezzar knew who all of these people were when they were little children. They were from the royal family. I want you to keep that in, in mind. So what you see here is this book covers from the time they were little babies. They were taking away, or at least let's say a significantly preteen. And I'm saying that because Zechariah and others talk about Daniel lived around 70 years, 75 years, and he prophesied almost that entire period of time. He died somewhere around 5 38, which is about two years before the end of the, the, the captivity. So these young fellows were children. So what I want to tell you is this. When you're studying these things, the books of Ezra, where I want to take a look, Lord willing, Sunday night, the first half of the book of Ezra, covers what happened on the back side of this 70 years of God saying, I'm reclaiming my Sabbaths. You haven't observed the Sabbath year like I planned for a long time. I'm reclaiming my time. I want my 70 years back. And that's what happened. He took the people off the land, and after 70 years, he will let them come back. Daniel was an eyewitness to all of that, and he, his observation deck was from the palace. That's when you'll see more about this throughout the text. So very different than the, the vantage point, if you will, of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Some of you may have seen this. If you haven't, I'll pass it around. But it talks about the time periods of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They were largely contemporaries of one another. So I'm going to put this in the back so you can uh, look at these, uh, pick one up after services. So I want to start. This is an index that I pulled off of a, from Mark Copeland's website. He has a good commentary. I'm not going to touch on all of this, but I'd like for you to read it. We are going to deal with these issues in, in great detail because we're going to pretty well go chapter by chapter. One last thing I'll tell you. The book of Daniel is split right down the middle. Twelve chapters. Six of these chapters are history. And six of them are prophecy. And it is very clear to see when that stops. And the fifth chapter is where you have the son of Nebuchadnezzar, or some people believe grandson, is having this big feast and he's using the goblets that came out of the temple when it was destroyed. And he's making a toast when this hand comes out of the wall, out of the sky, air, and begins writing on the wall. That's in the fifth chapter. The sixth chapter is Daniel in the lion's den. So you see all of these. The fourth chapter, two things involved here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What is the big story that we know about them in the book of Daniel? The fiery furnace. That occurs in the fourth chapter. What is the one big story that you know about Nebuchadnezzar? Or maybe you know a couple, but one in particular about Nebuchadnezzar. God sent him out and made him live like an animal. That happens in the fourth chapter. So what you're seeing is the first half of this book are history. They're great stories. They're history stories. When you get into the last six chapters, you're going to be talking or looking at the prophecy of the new Jerusalem being formed here and the kingdom, the kingdom of God. The book of Daniel is quoted many times, many, many times in the New Testament. <clears throat> the abomination of desolation. That phrase occurs in the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That comes right out of the book of Daniel. And he's dealing with the next time 
that Jerusalem will be destroyed in AD 70. But he uses the events that happened in the time of Daniel, Jesus does, to talk about what it's going to look like when Jerusalem is destroyed the next time, which would be many years to come. So, Lord willing, Sunday morning, I want to start with chapter 1, and we'll look at that in some detail, but we're going to cover the books of history, the six chapters, then the six chapters of prophecy. Wayne, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this quiet hour that we can come here this evening to study your word. Dear Heavenly Father, be with each of us. Pray that we'll be attentive and learn much from the word. As to be Brother Rick this evening as they present your word, that we may get much from it and be better Christians for it. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you be with all the teachers of the wings and as they present their work lessons to their uh, students as well. We pray to Heavenly Father that we'll always be found doing uh, your work and your purpose. We ask your Heavenly Father to remain with us this hour and all of our, uh, all the days of our life. Forgive us over many sins in Christ and we pray. Amen. 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 If you look about three quarters of the way down on your handout, you will see where we have listed Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And he has the the time period of each one of those men. When did they live? That doesn't always represent when they prophesied because God saw them the ability to see things many years to come. I'm going to tell you, Daniel prophesied all the way to the time of Alexander the Great, which would have been 300 years after he lived. He saw this with his own eyes, but he was able to see God showed this to him many years to come. Isaiah over here, if you take a look at this, he lived, he was prophesying 150 years before this city died. So, but it does tell you when the men lived, and they were contemporaries to one another. And you take a look at the early part of, look at Daniel and his time for just a moment. To give you an idea of what's taking place, in order for a nation to be a world empire, they have to conquer everybody, right? Do you know that just before the conquering of the southern kingdom, they conquered the northern kingdom. And they also conquered the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire's capital was what? Somebody tell me the, the capital city of, of Assyria. No. Nineveh. Does this, the name Nineveh ring a bell in any Old Testament story that we have? Jonah. Jonah. Do you know that Jonah prophesied around 800 B.C.? Now this will talk about the providence of God. Do you know that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the nation of Assyria in about 611? The nation of Assyria, one of the most heathen nations on earth, the fact that they all repented and turned to God. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. You see, after, after Jonah preached his story, even the king himself did that. This nation lasted another 190 years from the time God said to them, 40 days, 40 more days, and I'm going to wipe you out. So you realize <clears throat> that throughout all the book of Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, when God's saying, change your ways, Change your ways, come back to me. That God will make gigantic differences. But to make the point that the Babylonians that came in here and destroyed Jerusalem had wiped out the whole world. That's why it was a world empire. Now taking a look again at Daniel in his time. The name Daniel means God is my judge, which provides a hint of one of the key themes of the book. God will judge the nations of men Daniel was a person of deep and abiding faith. In chapter 1 and verse 8, there's a phrase that occurs, and it, you can see this multiple times. I'm going to back all the way up to Genesis chapter 6. There is a phrase to describe Noah. The phrase was, he was blameless in his generation. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 6 for a moment. In Genesis chapter 6, <coughs> verse 9, 
When God looked on the earth at this time, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, these are the records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time or generation. What would you guess that means? Okay. I don't know that he was perfect, but he was the... He served God. He was the best. He was the best God could find. Do you know that Abraham is, is described in much the same way? He was blameless or without reproach. Uh, you can see the same thing in Hezekiah. The same thing in Josiah. When these men set their minds at a young age to serve the Lord, they became different than everybody else. In chapter 1 of Daniel, verse 8, it tells you something when Daniel was a little boy. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food, with wine which he had drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the official that he might not defile himself. Now I want you to look at the next verse, because if you want to see a principle that is true throughout all of history, this is it. Do you believe that God will treat you the way you treat him. Yes. That he will treat you the same way you treat him. I have this conversation so many times with, with people, especially young people, who are not very strong, they're not very faithful. And they say to me on a regular basis, I have no proof that God's ever helped me. Okay? What have you done for him? Who starts in the deal? In verse 9, look at what happens in verse 9. Now God granted Daniel what? Favor and compassion. Do you feel that that's true in the story of Joseph? When Joseph was carried away from his family at 17 years of age, did God, did God show him favor? What about Jacob? You remember when Jacob was living with his father-in-law Laban? Everything Jacob touched turned to gold. Everything. There's a great story about uh, uh, God. Uh, basically, it was determined that Jacob was going to get some goats. And the white goats were a whole lot more important, a lot more valuable than the spotted goats. So Laban, his father-in-law, who was quite a trickster, it was interesting how David, how uh, Jacob was a trickster, but he became married to, uh, to a young lady whose daddy was worse than him. I'm going to give you all the spotted animals. All the spotted animals go, are going to go to you. Anybody know what happened to his wealth? It was massive because God was with him every single step of the way. So what you see is Daniel made a decision. And I'm going to focus on one thing for a minute. Daniel would have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from his mom and daddy. And from his grandparents. How does this happen? So I'm going to tell you something that was pretty amazing to me. We had a terrible shooting in Santa Fe. A young 17-year-old boy kills 10 people, wounds 10, uh, wounded 10 others. The next afternoon, the next day, I was at a homeschool graduation. We had three or 400 people, and there were 17 young people, 17 to 18 years of age, that graduated, and you had a chance to see them and talk to them, and they, they did these uh, videos of what their parents said about them, what they said, and you want to talk about a stark difference? These children who are 17 to 18 years old versus this young man, and we can say, well, that's their mom and dad. Well, you can use a thousand different things. Do you know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and Esther, made the, the decision to follow God without any regard for their parents. They made a decision on their own. What causes people to do that? You got any idea? Okay. Uh, you, you may very well think uh, that their parents had a big influence on them when they were young and it stuck with them. Moses spent the first 40 years of his life doing what? Where did he live? in the palace as Pharaoh's grandson. But when you see Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, where it talks about Moses, it says that he would not subject himself to the, the lifestyle of, Mo, of, of the Pharaoh. 
The reason is, he was not going to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season. What made him like that? Fortunately, he had his mom and sister with him. Daniel was one of these young people, and so were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's why the fiery furnace and the lion's den come into play in this text. Taking a look now in the, the, the bottom of page 1, you can see the fall of Nineveh in 612. That's what I'm talking about. So Jonah comes to them eight, set between 780 and 800. That nation literally lasted another 180 years. And it was a very old nation at that time. I hear people say sometimes, well, you know, our country's pretty old. Not compared to the nations of the past. The Babylonian Empire is oftentimes referred to as the Chaldeans. When was the first time in history that you knew of a man who left the Ur of the Chaldees to go to a place where God had called him to go. Anybody know who that was? Amen. Abraham, 2,000 years before Christ. That's how long the Babylonian Chaldean Empire was around. I'm going to tell you that um, I believe it was, I have to check this out, but I believe it was Ishmael who had a son named Nimrod that built the city of Nineveh. You can read that in the, in the chronology. It's in, the I think, the 11th chapter. These were old nations. So the Assyrian Empire was destroyed about the time that the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah were destroyed. In the second page, you see the battle here in 605. This is when Egypt was destroyed, taken over by Babylon. Every time you see a world empire, it meant they conquered the whole world. So there was, I'm giving you a bigger picture of what was happening besides just the city of Jerusalem. God, who called Jeremiah 25 and 27, he called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And in Jeremiah 27, he said to the world, if you don't bow your knee to Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to take care of you. So you want to know, how did Nebuchadnezzar become so strong? And by comparison, his son so weak. 597. But take a look at um, 605. is when the first group of people, I think this is probably written in there. This was the first group of people that were carried away. That was in 605. That's where you saw Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego brought over. 597, there is a second remnant that happens. 586, this is when Jerusalem is being destroyed and the Babylonians came in and they took everybody worth saving. Everybody that they thought had any value. Now they didn't look at value like God looks at value. They looked at value like, are you a brick mason? Are you a scholar? Can you sing? So the last people who the Babylonians thought had any value were pulled out in five, uh, 586. Now looking at this for a moment, people struggle with the math sometimes, so I'm going to give you a little bit of math. The 70 years that they were going to be taken off the land started in 606. This was the first very large, massive raid where they came in and took all of the royal children and all of the people they wanted. And I'm going to tell you this was probably very similar to, you remember a time when the angel of the Lord came over and everybody's house who didn't have blood on their door, what happened to them? This was the tenth plague. Every single animal, firstborn of every animal and every human being, and there was such a cry throughout all of the land. Can you imagine when the royalties who would not bow their knee to God, people came in and grabbed their children like they were like a, like maybe an eagle would grab a rat and pulled them out. So the, the 60 years, the 70 years rather, begins here and finishes in 536. That's where the book of Ezra we're going to read about. 
you can see that there will be several more groups of people. I don't want to talk a lot about that now. Ezra would come later, at the, after the end of the 70 years, Zerubbabel and Nehemiah. And you can see all of them exactly where they are. You can see in 457, the second remnant comes to Jerusalem after it's already starting to be built, the temple is built, and so forth. What I want you to look at, um, Daniel chapter 2. One of the most important things in this book, which is both historical and prophetic, <coughs> Daniel chapter 2 and verse 36. So here's a truth. Let's look in verse 31. This is very much like the story of Joseph, very similar. God gave Joseph a magical, wonderful gift that served him well all of his life. What was it? He could interpret dreams. That's exactly the gift that he gave Daniel. And the way Daniel was able to manifest that he had this ability was because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him very much. In verse 31, chapter 2 and verse 31, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single statue. Very much like Joseph. When you think about uh, the king says to Joseph, let me tell you my dream. Joseph says, I don't need you to tell me your dream. I know your dream. You don't need to tell me. That's exactly what's happening here. We're coming into this because Daniel says, I'm going to tell you what your dream was. So in verse 31, um, there was a single great statue, the statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor which stands in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of this statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron and feet, but partly of iron and clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands, and it was struck. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed it. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crumbled all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, so there was not a trace of them that was found. But the stone that crushed the statue became the great mountain and filled the whole earth. So he just told Nebuchadnezzar, this is the dream that you saw. Now, there were many wise men in the time of Joseph and in the time of, uh, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar where, will you tell us the dream and we'll tell you what the dream means. What do you think it means when in both of these men's cases, I don't need you to tell me the dream. I know what the dream is before you tell me. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? But look what happens now. What you see is, verse 36, this was the dream. Now I'm going to give you the interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. That's what I just told you in Jeremiah 25 and 27, where he called Nebuchadnezzar, you are my servant. I'm going to make the world bow down to you. He goes on to say, uh, verse 37, who, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and power and strength and glory, and wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky, he gave them all into your hands. He literally gave Nebuchadnezzar all of that. And has caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold in this picture. Now this is the first world empire. I ask a question, and we had a good conversation about it. So we have four world empires here. The last empire was the Roman Empire, which occurred around the first of the century. It was the New Testament period was in the middle of all of that. Has there been another world empire since that time? No. No. A lot of people tried. China has tried. Russia has tried. Some people would say the United States of America has tried to run the whole world business. We can't even take care of ourselves. But here's what he says now in verse 38 and verse 39. After you, 
there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, and then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over them. I want you to look, and I have... Um, Let's see, some place in here it shows the four kingdoms, four world empires. I'm probably looking right at it. I thought it was in this text. I should have written it down. At any rate, we'll, we'll come back to that. The first world empire was the Assyrian Empire, or the, or the Babylonian Empire that took over the Assyrian Empire. I'll take a look at verse 39. There will be a second and a third. I want to talk about that in chapter 5 in just a moment. What was the next world empire? This is what I want you to look at. Verse 40. Then there will be a fourth, a fourth world empire. Strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters things, so iron, like that breaks into pieces, it will crush and break all of these into pieces, all these other nations. Every other world empire, the second one and the third one, will be completely wiped out, as will the first one, by the fourth world empire. Verse 41, And that you saw the feet of toes, uh, and toes partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, in that they didn't mix. They never mixed together. They did not assimilate. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have its toughness of iron in as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As for the toes and the feet, partly of iron, partly of pottery, some of the kingdom will be strong and part will be brittle, easily broken. As in you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. I want to stop with a minute before we look at verse 44, what happens in the days of these kings. Let's talk a little bit about what was the Babylonian Empire attempting to do with these young boys and girls. Let's just take Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and uh, Daniel. Most of you study the first chapter. What are they trying very hard to do? We, talk, we hear this word all the time in America. We're bringing over millions of people from all over the world, and we hope they assimilate. How well does that work? Not to, I used to work, spend a little bit of time, a good bit of time, in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan is a town of a half million people and a Somali population of a quarter of a million. 50% of the, the city is Somali. Now, the Babylonians <clears throat> were the first to come up with, we're going to take people from here and we're going to carry you over here. And we're going to take you from here away from your mom and daddy. We're going to put you over here. We're going to give you a new name. We're going to teach you completely different things. We're going to feed you different food. And the whole idea was to get people to assimilate to speak the same language, to have the same name. You saw exactly the same thing in what is called the Hellenistic period, the time of Alexander the Great. The Romans conquered people so fast, they didn't even worry about people assimilating. That's why they are described as, do you think you could take iron, uh, places in most of uh, the most, uh, lots that I have seen, including this one, we're looking for a stake. So we take, a, <clears throat> we take a metal detector, somebody does, and they find a stake that was maybe put down there 50 to 100 years ago. Do you think that stake ever mixed with the mud around it? That was a wonderful description of the Roman Empire. They were about conquering the world, and they were doing it so fast they could care less about assimilation. That was their downfall. In verse 44, in the days of that fourth kingdom, which was the Roman Empire, God, the God of heaven, will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So we had four world empires <clears throat> in 600 years. Here's around 600 BC, the Babylonians, the Medo Persians, uh, all the way to the Roman Empire here. 600 years, we have four world empires. 
and they all were destroyed. But in the days of those kings, the Roman Empire, God was going to set up a kingdom. And how long was it going to last? When I think about how is there a church worshiping in Brazoria, Texas? How is there a church meeting in West Columbia, Texas? And you just go all around here, tiny little towns, 2,000 years later. That is the best proof text that the kingdom of God will always be around. Now take a look at this in verse 44. A kingdom that will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. And it will crush and put an end to these kingdoms, but itself will endure forever. Now let's just stop for a minute. When Jesus was 30 years of age and he began, began his ministry, the book of Mark tells us he was 30 years old, approximately 30. Once he started becoming popular and large numbers of people were coming to hear him, thousands of people, the Jews started to hate him and the Romans were trying to keep peace. How did they treat Jesus? How did they treat the Christians in that day and time? Persecuted them incredibly. So the, the revelation, the last story. <laughs> I thought, man, that's the large, uh, loudest phone I ever heard. <laughs> we don't usually have that door open. So uh, incredible persecution. But eventually, those people would destroy, with God's help, the Roman Empire. Isn't that amazing? Look at what he says in verse 44. That nation, that kingdom that God would set up, it would crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but itself will endure. Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it crushed the iron. Here was the big stone that hit the feet of this great statue that, that um, Nebuchadnezzar was seeing and that Daniel told him about, and it just crushed it like it was chaff. He says this in verse 45, it crushed the iron and bronze and clay and silver and gold. The great God has made known to the king that it will take place in the future, in the future, so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. How do you think the Babylonian Empire <clears throat> that was destroyed a hundred years later by the Medo-Persians? You might be turning to chapter 5. Chapter 5. The Persians and the Medes who came together and formed a world empire. All of these empires eventually blew up. They self-destructed. How do you think the kingdom that God set up that God pictured as a giant stone that rolls against all of these world kingdoms and crushes them all like chaff and didn't fire a shot. Nobody carried a weapon. When Jesus, you remember when Peter pulled out his sword and he cut off the ear of Malchus? Did Jesus applaud him? What's the first thing he did when he cut off this Roman soldier's ear? He reached down and picked it up and put it back on. And then he said, put away your sword. We're not going to fight. But this nation, <clears throat> the nation that Jesus built, the kingdom, is around today. Do you think, no matter how wicked the Russians become, or the Chinese, or the Americans, it's going to destroy, destroy God's kingdom? Not a chance on earth. That's what we're going to talk about. And I will tell you it is one of the central themes to the book of Daniel. And that was the kingdom that Jesus Christ would set up. That God would establish and it would destroy all the other nations. Any questions before we close? Now let's look at chapter 5 just for a second. You turn there. So you want to know how did the Babylonian Empire that destroyed the Assyrians and destroyed the Egyptians and all of these, how did it go away with a whimper? Verse 20, Daniel 5, 29. This is where Belshazzar has seen this in verse 28. Now, uh, Daniel tells what his 
what his vision was. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. And Belshazzar gave an order and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a, a necklace of gold on his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that now he is, has the authority as the third ruler of the kingdom. That same night, the very night of this great feast, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius, or some people call that Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom at about age 62. Isn't it amazing? This nation that rolled over the rest of the world like a giant stone, this is, it, it literally died with a whimper. All right, I want to pick up, we will look at Daniel chapter 1. Sunday morning, I want to talk about how young people can serve God and still be sweet and kind and considerate and obedient. We'll talk about that in Daniel chapter 1, Lord willing, Sunday morning. I ask that you be with them, you come to them. Father, I thank you for this church and the elders. I thank you for the lessons we receive. And Father, lift our hearts and spirits to let Christ Jesus reign over our life and guide us for the rest of our days. In 
Christ Jesus' name I pray. Song number 19, Heavenly Sunlight. Am I talking that loud or is there a mic on? I thought I heard an echo. chapter, the very first word, but these, uh, but there rose false prophets also among the people, 
as among yourself also there shall be false teachers. A horrible thing happened. Jesus' death was a horrible thing. But it was a necessary thing. But a horrible thing happened. And that is that people decided to teach everything. False prophets. And the false prophets in Jesus' day and the days before Jesus, as far as that's concerned, ruined God's plan to save man. Not ruined it, but damaged it in the sense that not all men are saved. They believed a lie. I'll read one more verse. This one from Galatians, the first chapter. The Apostle Paul had been in Galatia, and he taught there, and people believed there. They had the power to become sons of God, and they became sons of God. But he wrote the letter because <clears throat> he had heard some bad things had happened. These false teachers had come to Galatia, or the Galatian area. I marvel that you are so quickly removed from him that called you in the grace of Christ and to a different gospel, which is not another gospel, only there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven should preach unto you any gospel other than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Or that one. That seems like justice. The false teacher is going to spend eternity in hell. The problem is, that's justice, but the problem is all the people that he convinces to believe another gospel or a false gospel or a perverted gospel are going to spend eternity with him. God wants all people to say, be saved. Everybody that believes that Jesus is the Son of God has the power to become the Son of God. But not everybody does. It's a sad story, but it's a true story. If you're in this building tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, what's your situation? You need to give consideration to the fact that even though you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you have a wonderful thing, but it's not the thing you need. The thing you need is salvation. And Jesus Christ, who died for you, said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. John said in John 1 12, You have the power to become sons of God, but you're not there. You need to take the step that Jesus requires and be baptized in the Christ. Tonight will be a good night. A lot of people have heard these words over and over and over again. It worries us when they don't obey the gospel of Christ. We know that our consciences have become callous. The Bible talks about it. When we keep doing things that God Told us wrong, and you keep doing them, our conscience becomes callous. When you keep hearing these words that I'm saying to you tonight, not that I've got the magic, but God does. You keep hearing these words, and you won't obey the gospel of Christ. It becomes easier and easier and easier for you just listen to them, but not obey them. If there's any other problems that you have tonight, we can talk about that and pray about it and take care of it.
But to those that haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, you have to make a conscious effort to be born again. It's not something that's going to happen on its own. If we can help you in any way, won't you come forward as we stand and sing for your encouragement? Have you said to Jesus, born of cleansing fire, are you washing the blood of the
Help us, dear God, not to rely upon our own wisdom. Help us not to rely upon the wisdom of man. Help us, to God, that we must have a thus saith the Lord to prove those things, test those things that men say today, to see if they are the, from thee or from the man or the mind of man. Dear God, be with us. Protect us in our, in our journey. Help us, dear God, to always put our faith in you and our trust in you every hour and every minute of the day. Forgive us again of our sins and help us to forgive those who trespass against us. Be with us always, dear God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.